A lot of times on this channel, I've referred to Tesla's supercharging network as one of the best advantages Tesla has going for it. And some of you may disagree, but at the same time, there's sort of a double-edged sword when building your own proprietary charging network because on one hand, you are helping accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. You're making people feel more comfortable with going across country, going great distances, and being able to charge up the car in a fast and efficient manner. While at the same time, Tesla is kind of making it a little bit harder for the rest of the auto industry when there's so many different charging connector types to choose from, at least here in the United States, Europe was way ahead of their time and made sure to establish a charging system connector, the combined charging system standard to be exact over there, which even Tesla supercharger support, but that doesn't mean that all the superchargers in Europe can charge any EV. So that kind of results in Tesla expanding their network, which is great for their cars and great for their consumers, but also means you're expanding the network in a way that other EVs EV companies can't really adopt unless, of course, they start building out or adopting a different charging standard. So here in the US, we have the J1772 connector, we have the Chatamo network, and we're also getting a lot of CCS connectors between lots of different third parties expanding their charge networks, and Tesla gets to reap the benefits of this because Tesla includes a J1772 adapter with their vehicles so that Teslas can charge at charge points that are not superchargers, but sadly, that benefit only goes one way because non-Tesla electric vehicles are unable to charge at Tesla supercharger networks. Now we've heard before from many people that Tesla is open to letting others access their supercharger network, but we don't really know the fine print of that contract. And we've even seen EV startups like Bollinger ask Tesla specifically if they'd be able to use the supercharger network and they never heard back from them. So maybe they were too small or not major enough for Tesla to take their time, but it's fairly possible now that I think Tesla, while they may seem to be open to letting other companies use the supercharging network, they might not really want to do it yet. They might say, well, yeah, eventually we want to get to that point. Or they may also start requiring EV companies to pay them an upfront fee or they get a percentage of every supercharging session. And perhaps that deal that other automakers have looked into is simply not worth it since no one else wants to do it. Or it's also possible legacy automakers are just being a little bit stubborn and they decided that making an electric vehicle that charges at your competitor's supercharger would just be overall bad look for the company and the brand. So if you're selling the Ford Mach-E or the Lucid Air, you don't want to be stopped at a Tesla supercharger because then you're kind of admitting that the rival has the better stuff. They have the better network to charge off of. There's lots of different theories, none of which can be absolutely proven right now because we don't know what these backdoor contracts entail. But the truth is the supercharger network really does help sell Tesla vehicles because a lot of people who are converting to electric want to make sure that they have something they can fall back on that's like a gas station or better so that they don't have to think that differently when using their vehicle. And if they can know, hey, I've got all of these different charge locations and all of these different connectors across the United States or across the world that I can charge off of, that makes the transition to electric a whole lot easier than a lot of these other EVs in the United States, which you kind of have to know what connectors you're going for. It's not so simple as is just being like, oh, I'm a Tesla, I charge at the supercharger. Now it's like, go to the charter mode network, or you can find a DC fast charger, or you can find a CCS charger, or Electrify America has certain rates, and it costs a certain amount just to plug in, and then a certain amount per minute charging, or some charge by the kilowatt used, and all of these things are going to require you to sign up with a certain account, or pay on the spot with a credit card, or again, requiring the driver to make that plan, and make those routes, and be like, okay, which chargers can I stop at, which ones have the connectors that my car supports. Whereas Tesla, very smartly in a lot of ways, built all of that into the software navigation of the vehicle, which just means when you plug in a far off destination in your Tesla, it can tell you exactly where to go so you don't even have to think about it. It's already routing you to a supercharger. In a lot of cases we see it can already precondition the battery so that once you plug in, you charge really, really quickly and it handles all of the billing and registration as soon as you plug in and that data between the car and the charger is exchanged. That saves a whole lot of time and is a lot easier for people to understand, which is what makes Tesla such a great offer. And I think business-wise, this was a really, really smart move, but it does make a lot of people who are overall not ready to make the switch to electric and are unaware of the different connectors and the different charge points and the different charge speeds. It can make them kind of frustrated because now they're thinking, hold on, wait a second. With my gas car, I can stop at any gas station, right? It doesn't really matter what type of car I drive or what type of gas station I stop 
that if my car takes unleaded, pretty much anywhere I go in the United States can provide unleaded gas. But if I switch to an electric car, now I have to keep track of, well, this car takes this type of charger, this car takes this type of charger, and I could even drive to certain charge points that don't even have the right connector, or I don't have an account for, so I'm gonna have to open my phone and download the right app to sign up and all that. And all of that frustration can really steer away someone who's not really that tech savvy, not someone who watches these types of videos and knows the differences between the different connectors and charge points. It can be a little bit overwhelming if your whole life you've been used to go to a gas station, fill up, gas car. It's that simple. And we kind of have a chicken and an egg dilemma with the United States at least with Tesla rolling out superchargers because when Tesla initially started launching vehicles like the Model S and they wanted to build out their charge network, at the time there really wasn't much of agreed upon standard because Tesla was so new and so unique to the auto industry that there weren't that many companies out there working on public EV charge points that we should all agree on one type of connector, again, that Europe decided to do, which was much smarter. But here in the US that meant that Tesla said, okay, we're all about vertical integration, so we're going to design our own charging connector that our vehicles are going to use and destination chargers can use so that at hotels and restaurants, people can put in level two charge points. And then the supercharger network, of course, which is the most expansive and most readily accessible network. And also not just having the most stations, but having the most stalls to charge from. And Tesla has not stopped accelerating that growth with the V3 supercharger network and being able to charge cars up up to 250 kilowatts. It's really strong powerful that no other public charger company has been able to catch up with what Tesla has had to offer. So that means that there's these other standards that the rest of the industry is agreeing upon, whether it be CCS or J1772, way too complicated names. I agree, we need to shorten these down a little bit. But I'm guessing Tesla isn't that interested in selling their proprietary connector. Or if they are, Tesla's gonna want a piece of every company that uses their proprietary connector. And of course, third parties aren't gonna be too happy about that. They want it to be brand free and universal for everyone to use. And Tesla's gonna feel like they should get a piece on that action. So Tesla is kind of in a position to dominate now because if you're thinking about making that switch to electric, you're kind of gonna be in a more awkward and confusing point if you decide to not go with a Tesla and now you have to anticipate those stops and understand which connectors your charge point is using. It's kind of a similar situation with the iPhone adopting Lightning and USB-C being very common in the Android field. Back when Apple introduced Lightning on the iPhone 5, USB-C was not a thing. In fact, most of the charge connectors that other phones were using were sloppy and not symmetrical or reversible and much harder to plug into and there were lots of them and the market hadn't really agreed on something. So Apple put their foot down and said, okay, we're going to make our own connector. And that's what iPhones are going to use. We use lightning now and they're still using lightning, but now the rest of the industry has kind of moved on with a universally agreed third party standard, which is USB-C, which is reversible and easy to plug in. And now we're kind of stuck with two different reversible connectors that phones can choose from, but Apple's going to stick with lightning, of course, because they designed it and everybody else is sticking with USB-C because it's so simple and accessible. And there's so many USB-C cases cables out there that now if Apple decided to switch to USB-C on their iPhone, there would be a lot of useless lightning cables out there. So we're kind of in a similar place in the United States with Tesla superchargers because Tesla probably doesn't want their connector to become open source for anyone to use without getting a cut. And other companies don't want to adopt Tesla's proprietary connector because they want to have an open standard that they're already using, whether it's the J1772, CCS, or the Chartamo network. They have all these options that they're trying to unify, but none of them are expanding or is growing as much as the Tesla supercharger network. So if Tesla decided, hey, all US cars are gonna now start adopting CCS, then every single supercharger in the United States would now need to be retrofitted with new connectors, new cables. It would cost millions, probably billions of dollars to switch everything over. And all of the Teslas driving on the road today would still be stuck with that older Tesla proprietary connector, meaning they would all have to get retrofit. So this is not a easy, simple solution to solve. That's why it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, there's benefits of Tesla being more vertically integrated and allowing them to have complete control because the supercharger network by far is the best charging network out there. It's simple. It's really easy to use. There's lots of them. They charge
charge fast and you just don't even have to think about it. You just drive your car in and plug in. But at the same time, Tesla has made it so good and they've made it so proprietary and vertically integrated that now it's very, very difficult for other people to get on board with it. And Tesla has not seemed to make it super easy for other people to tap into because no one else will do it. And I don't think it's just because everyone's too stubborn. As we saw with Bollinger, they have been interested in doing it since 2018 and Tesla still has not gotten back to them. So that means for the short term, at least, yeah, it's going to be kind of confusing for people making that switch to electric, particularly if you don't want to buy a Tesla. But if you do want to buy a Tesla, I guess you'll be good. You'll have a very expansive network to choose from. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's that big an issue because most people are charging from home in the first place. You can charge in your garage or just outside your house and just plug in. And while it does charge slowly, most people can do it more affordably that way. And it's kind of different than gas stations, which everyone has to use because most of us don't fill up our cars with gas from home. So having lots of different connectors and standards and charge points across the United States might be a little bit frustrating during the road trip, but for the day-to-day -day driving, it's really not that bad because you're just plugging in at home and waking up to a full charge. Overall though, I hope we can get some solutions. You know, Tesla has said that they're trying to find a universal standard for the Tesla Semi that the rest of the industry can agree on so we don't have this big mess of different connectors and charge points that we have now. So I think they're trying to be more smart about it moving forward, but what do you guys think? Should Teslas adopt a more universal standard or should everyone else adopt a Tesla standard? Feel free to let me know what your guys' opinions on it and keep Keep in mind, just one guy's opinion. I don't have control over any of this stuff. So if you disagree with me, let's at least remain respectful. Thank you all for watching. Hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Take care.